Boundless Authenticity Podcast, where we discuss everything related to the evolution of human consciousness. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Boundless Authenticity Podcast. My guest today is Lisa McSherry, author, priestess, and world traveler. Lisa is the author of several books, including The Virtual Pagan and Magical Connections. And today, we are going to talk about her latest book, A Witch's Guide to Crafting Your Practice, Create a Magical Path That Works for You. I have to say, it was a great read and explains the art and craft very well in a realistic, grounded way and is the perfect book for anyone looking to expand their consciousness and spiritual practice in a healthy, joyful way. Check out her work on lisamcsherry.com. Let's hop into the chat. So Lisa, so Lisa how's, how's it, going? it going? It is going great. And I am so very glad to be here tonight. That's, That's awesome. awesome. I, I was, was very, very excited, excited to speak with you. you. Um, um, when you say tonight, tonight, what do you mean? Where are you? <laughs> well, that's right. You might not realize I actually live in Portugal. Oh, so wow. I'm several hours ahead of you. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. I did not know that. That's awesome. So tell everybody about you. Oh, well, where do we begin? Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of history there. My name is Lisa McSherry. I am an author, a teacher, and a priestess, and I just wrote a book, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, I've retired, and I live in Portugal, and with my husband, didn't we travel a lot and are exploring an entirely new life outside of the United States? That sounds, that like, sounds fun. like fun. <laughs> <laughs> it it is. That. So when so you when say, you say priestess, priestess, what do you mean? What do you mean? Good question. Uh, I see my way of being in the world and the way my spirituality and, and my religious focus is to be of service to the larger community. Generally speaking, that's the alternative spirituality community because other groups have either no interest whatsoever in deity or they've got their own religious apparatus to work with. But I offer my services to the community and that sometimes takes the form of helping write rituals for life passages such as baby blessings or marriages uh, or just acknowledging uh, a transfer in one's life from one state to another. I, For example, I helped a young man acknowledge the fact that now that he was in his 20s, he actually felt like an adult. Um, so we wrote a ritual around that. But I also uh, have a review website where there are at least 10 reviews of items uh, that my and my review circle write every month. And so people can kind of get an idea of what's out there and what's interesting. And then I write for my community uh, and offer, I hope, my wisdom, <laughs> at least a smoothing of the path ahead of people um, who might be interested in what I'm doing. That's, That's awesome. awesome. And, I'm and I'm really, really glad, glad that, that you said it in, in that, that way, because I have a bone to pick with a lot of people where things like witchcraft and, and other things are concerned. What we see in the mainstream these days is Hollywood witchcraft. It's not the real deal. And so people automatically think, oh, that's what it is. Therefore, it must be some crazy stuff that's bad. And you see these people walking around with like Baphomet plushies and all this garbage. <laughs> and they, you know, they get really afraid. But what you just described is the traditional sense of the art. You know, and, and that's a beautiful thing to bring to people's awareness because we've got to stop with the stereotypes and turn off the damn TV, man. <laughs> that's my biggest thing. Just turn off TV because it's influencing your reality in ways that will block you from higher wisdom, you know, and, and understanding of people. So I know that you wrote a book. It's called A Witch's Guide to Crafting Your Practice. Create a Magical Path That Works for You. Tell me about that. Well, you know, the title is actually pretty self-explanatory, which is quite nice. Um, I, I happen to be a witch, so that is my background that I come from. But I think 
I'm biased, I admit, but I think that this background uh, allows me to offer people an opportunity to create a spirituality that actually resonates with what they want to be doing and allows them to step away from, if you will, the religion of origin and find a path that actually brings them joy and brings them closer to whatever we're going to call the cosmic all, you know, the deity, the divine God, goddess, all those words. What we're talking about is something a little bit larger than ourselves that is offering us a path to being better people. Or at least this is how I see it and how I define it. So I sat down one day and I just took, honestly, I took the 20 years that I've been teaching newcomers to witchcraft and I said, okay, what are the core practices? What are the things that you you really want to start with and, and begin with on this path that you can then add things to layers to bells, whistles, whatever further brings you joy. But if you do these things, first of all, you're not going to blow up the world. Second of all, you're not going to blow up yourself (laughs) Um, with a lot of reassurance that it's hard to do it wrong. Okay. The most, the worst that's really going to happen is you're going to get sidetracked and you're going to look back and say, I wasted a lot of time on doing X, Y, and Z. I was distracted by Hollywood to sort of borrow your phrase. And, um, but you're, but you know, it's, it was, it's a simplifying of the path you know, based on the fact that I've been doing this for, uh, I don't know, almost 40 years now, more than 40 years now. So it's just kind of like, hey, I've walked that path a lot. Let me just point out a few simple things you can do. Smoothing of the way. Yeah, I love that description because any course of spiritual action can be magical. In fact, if you are really trying to connect with the creator of all that is, you will come across these more deep um, forms of wisdom and you will come to learn things about the history of, of all of these practices and you realize that it's essentially just different forms of the same thing. And um, Exactly. I mean, there are a million paths to the top of the mountain, metaphorically speaking, there is no one true path. And in fact, that's very much my credo. My group's credo is there is no one true way. There are many, many ways to get there. We happen to have a way that is possible. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's a good thing. It's a really great thing. So tell us really what is a witch? (laughs) In my opinion, a witch is somebody who does their best to align their energies with the natural energies all around them. And having done so, sort of feels that they comes to a place where they are able to nudge that energy just a little bit in a direction that makes their life better and making their life better makes their community's life better, thereby making the world better. But it starts with the self and the one. It's an incredibly empowering, powerful way of moving through the world because we take ownership for everything that we cause in life, for all of the consequences, seen and unseen. We take ownership of it and not in a humbling, ash cloth wearing, you know, I'm so wretched manner, but in fact, in a, all right, I did some harm. How can I make up for it? How can I make it better? What good can I do to try and balance um, to the best of my ability, which is not always possible. You know, we acknowledge that um, we acknowledge that we are human and have frailty, but we do our best. And that matters a lot. I love that. I mean, that's what it's really all about. And uh, you said something earlier that made me chuckle a little bit because people tend to have that perspective that's influenced by whatever is in Hollywood. And they think, oh, if I do this, I'm spell casting and uh, I'm going to set demons on myself or somebody else. And it's like, come on, 
<laughs> Give Sabrina the teenage witch a break and get back to reality. Because uh, I, I would love for you to expand on the fact that in that way that you refer to yourself as a priestess, that's the original point of these things. People would go and, um, you know, they'd have the medicine woman who would prepare entheogens and things like that. Expand on that for us. Um, well, that's a sort of an area of other cultures is not an area I can speak to very well. I am, I am a white woman who has grown up in Western culture and specifically in America. I don't, cannot speak for those other cultures uh, very well at all. What I can talk about is the fact that it's really important in my worldview and in witchcraft to understand that when someone says that they're a priest, they're not trying to get in the way of anyone else's relationship with the divine. They're, they are helping to or trying to facilitate a deeper or richer relationship. And that is enormously important because so many of the religions, if you will, the religions of the books, because they have books, the solitary or a group of books that they look to and can refer to all the time. We just can't do that. We have no central authority. We, we have no one person we look to. We have no book we look to. We can't even agree on most things <laughs> um, sufficient to all, you know, say, yeah, let's all say the same thing at the same time. Nope, 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 really doesn't happen. Um, but there's a strength in that level of individuality because we welcome everyone who feels like they're out of step if they you know everyone who feels like i'm supposed to stand up now because everyone else is standing up because the guy is saying some words and now we're all sitting okay now we're all sitting and, and like that's the extent of what they feel when they go to religious service yeah we're much more like sit if you want stand if you want shout if you want you know we're we're feel what you want to feel and uh and do this as part of a group or on your own but you were the one who has a connection to deity you are the one who talks directly to god and in doing so you're talking to yourself which i think is really really important yeah that's the most important part i think for a lot of people they tend to externalize things in that way so tell us about the book of shadows the book of shadows is the first step it's not the first step for everyone it's the first step as far as i'm concerned because book of shadows is a notebook pad of paper and your pencil and all it is supposed to do is start keeping track of this amazing journey that you're about to go on. You start at the beginning with why you want to do this. What is interesting you about it? In, in my book, I actually literally phrase it as why do you want to be a witch? Change that phrase to why you want to walk this path or whatever words that make sense. And you write that down which is really important because I guarantee you in six months, you'll look back at that, what you wrote and you will either recognize it or you will say, Oh, I am so different from that now. And you will move on. And that's really important because there is so much distraction and activity going on all around us that we do not pay attention to or get completely distracted by. So when we take the time to sit and write down what's important to us and why we're going to be the spiritual beings that we're going to be, then what we're telling our brain and ourselves is that this is important. Pay attention. And every time you go back to your book and write some more, your brain goes, oh, this is important. Oh, this is the good stuff. And it becomes a kind of a trigger for, ooh, I'm doing a thing. I'm doing an important thing. This is valuable. I need to make time for it. And so we reinforce a very positive behavior. 
And also, quite honestly, if we don't write it down, we forget it. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's really a key part of it, um, as is handwriting it out. That's a very important thing for me. I know I can hear a lot of your listeners going, oh, I never write anything down. And it's like, no, no, take the time to do this. I actually have physical pad and paper because science has proven over and over again that the act of writing triggers a lot of things in our brain that make us pay attention again making us pay attention taking this seriously and the writing itself becomes a kind of a magical act it becomes an energetic act and in its own way it's you're kind of doing a spell your first spell on yourself I would agree with that. I mean, I issue a workbook with my coaching clients and it's essentially the same thing. It's like spell casting on your life. It's making whatever is unconscious conscious so you can look at it and have an opportunity to change that. I mean, we tend to have this belief that they can just sit around and think and they can then change their external circumstances or change themselves based on thought alone. You do have to dig in in some instances and, and plan things out and get familiar, become intimate with all of the little corners of your mind and the reasons why you want to do something, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and also witchcraft, what I practice is a craft. It is not just sitting around reading books. You, I mean, you can call yourself a witch if all you do is read books. Yes, absolutely. I, I am not a gatekeeper. I do not hold anyone back from using those words. In my opinion, however, it is when you take that which you are reading and learning and do something with it. That's when you are a witch because that's when you are activating your power and becoming more real within the world and taking control and taking responsibility. All of those things are bound up with one another. Now that you say taking responsibility, I'm going to try to give up responsibility here because I'm not asking you the questions. It's my friend here that's asking you the questions. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, what I would love to talk about now is creating your altar. This is a piece I took off of my little space of worship. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty much the second step is creating an altar, which I use the word altar because that's the terminology from my practice. An altar is any flat surface, it's kind of like with the Book of Shadows. It does not need to be an elaborate construct. It does not even need to be something that is out all the time and visible all the time. I spent years living with roommates in college and thereafter. And my altar was literally a wooden box with a hinge top. And when I had privacy, when I had safe space, I could pop that lid off, pull my stuff out, set up my altar, do my witchy stuff <laughs> and then put it all back down. And all my roommates ever knew was maybe the scent of incense in the air when they came back, you know? And um, so I'm a big advocate of do what you can. Do the same thing as repetitively as you possibly can. I mean, if you've just got a box that you have to set up somewhere, no problem. Try to set it up at the same space. In, in your private space, um, only because what you want to do is create a habit in your brain of when I do this, when I go to this space, I'm doing something different. I'm stepping outside of the mundane. And this is where we begin to create sacred, a sense of sacred, which is... <sighs> Sacred is complicated on a lot of levels, but sacred is what we take important, what we make important, excuse me. It is when we acknowledge that we are a part of a greater reality, we're touching the sacred. And going to an altar every day and sitting there, being there, being in that space sets up a different resonance for ourselves. And it's the first step to creating sacred space. And it can have nothing on it. It could have many things on it. This is often where people get very excited about buying 
lots of stuff and that's so much fun it's so much fun <laughs> um because it can feel so very affirming that you're you're doing something supportive of yourself and and it's it's fun uh but i'm a big fan also of keeping it very minimal if you have to um i've just spent the last year uh, living without my possessions most of my possessions for a variety of reasons but it was part of the move to uh, portugal where i am now and i didn't have a formal altar for an entire year after having one for 20 plus years previous it was a really big shift and um it changed my practice a lot because while I still had the foundation element of the altar, many of the things I had taken for granted all around it just weren't there anymore. And it really honed my perspective and brought me down to some very foundational elements, literally foundational elements, because I couldn't count on having, I, I have no metaphysical shop here. I, I have no ability to walk in and just buy a crystal. <laughs> For example, I live in a town where I can buy all the incense and candles I want, but other things are just not possible. So, you know, a glass of water became very representative to me. I could always get water. I could always get salt. I could always get a picture of a flame if I needed it. And, um, you know, usually there was nothing for air because I would just breathe. And that was how I had the four elements present on my altar at any given time. But that was it. Mm, I love that. So, uh, you know, we probably opened this up a little bit, but just give us a definition. What is magic? <laughs> um, magic is changing reality in, in accordance with your will. Thank you, Aleister Crowley, for giving us that succinct definition 70 years ago, whenever it was. But it's one that I usually just go back to over and over again, because that is, for me, it's the definition, the, the core of what magic is. Yeah, I, I like that you use that definition. People tend to take the do what thou wilt thing and run in the opposite direction with it. A lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> coming with all this crazy stuff but it really it's it's all in your head i mean how important is the mental aspect of this oh it's vital it's absolutely vital i mean if you can't see what you want to have happen you will never achieve it you know, that's that's i mean well i won't say never never is a bad word to use the likelihood of achieving it is very very tiny and almost more random than anything else i'm a believe it or not i'm actually a huge skeptic i like to see the proof of how things work before i adopt them into my practice or even go with it so i had to be shown successful magic so many times before I finally said, okay, there's, there's something to this magic thing and I'm going to follow it. Um, and so for me, one of the, the things I really keep track of in my book of shadows is when I do spell work, I track whether it was successful. And if it wasn't, I go and try and figure out why, where I change something and I do it again or or sometimes I just simply have to admit that I don't get to have that thing that I want for, because, you know, it's because reasons and almost always it's because there's something better than what I'm imagining. I'm, I'm trying to imagine a blue car and the universe is like, oh, how would you like a nice blue car? It's like, ooh, <laughs> metaphorically. <laughs> right. So what are your favorite tools to use? <laughs> my brain. Uh, but that's a very facile answer. Um, part of which, most of which does in fact come out of the fact that I haven't had anything for the last year. So it's been a lot of using my finger and using my brain and using my own personal energy to create things. Um, but when I have access to all my tools, which I just got like a couple of weeks ago, um, I have a very beautiful athame, which is a ritual knife that was gifted to me a long time ago. Um, it has a jet and obsidian blade 
that has been set into a deer's antler, a piece of a deer's antler, and it has a curve to it. And it's all handmade, and partly because it was, in fact, gifted to me. It's one of my favorite pieces to work with uh, on on many, many levels. Um, I mean, that's my favorite tool. (laughs) Everything else I can do without. I, I have a turkey feather I love and I've had since college. Um, you know, I have, I have some items that are, are spell related that are private, um, that I always will have, but they'll probably go into the ground with me metaphorically. Um, but uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty great. I was about to say that a uh, knife must be pretty good for chopping away negative energy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite powerful. It's, it's, a. Uh, it was a reluctant ad because I had an actual traditional athame with black handle, double bladed that I, I'd gotten back in college, which I do love, love to this day, but I just don't use it anymore because the other, the new, the quote newer one, which is going on 15 years now, I think, um, is just feels so absolutely correct for everything. That's really great. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about the misperception when it comes to things like inviting certain energies to work with you and things like that. How do you mean the misperceptions? There's a lot of people that say, oh, she's a witch. She's going to talk to elementals and they're going to do strange things. And, you know, I, I would love to clear that up because this book that you've written is such a great platform in itself for people to really learn what this is all about and understand that we are all magical. We're all in a sea of energy and we can all, you know, work with these concepts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. It's not always about working with the elementals. It's my preferred first step, um, partly just because of how I see the world. But um, when we create sacred space, you know, like for example, when we cast a circle, um, we are not casting a circle because we're trying to keep demons locked within the barrier, you know, <laughs> um, or keep the ravening hordes from getting in if we're standing inside the circle. Um, we cast the circle kind of for the same reason when we go to our altar. Um, when we go to sacred space, we are setting aside this little piece of reality and we are making it safe. For, um, but more importantly, we're making it sacred. Okay. And, and that makes us sacred. It allows us to allow to release our inner divinity and kind of do things with it because if you're going to change reality you have to acknowledge the fact that you're powerful this is kind of a thing that a lot of new people newcomers to witchcraft in particular have to sort of wrap their heads around like yes magic works so that's a powerful thing yes magic works (laughs) let's let's talk about that um and then for me you know I always think of casting a circle and and creating sacred space as kind of like I'm having a really amazing dinner party. So I want to invite amazing creatures, beings to come and join me because it's a party and we're going to get some some stuff done and we're going to have some fun. And yes, it might be a little solemn and, you know, perhaps I'm just going to honor them and give them, you know, the worship that they are due because that's the ritual that I'm doing. Um, but also perhaps we're going to get together and do a thing, you know, be like a work party and work parties are always more fun. I mean, it's kind of like when you move into a new apartment, it's a lot more fun if people come and help and you pay them in pizza and beer and (laughs) then you say, thanks. (laughs) Um, so that's sort of my thought about, inviting other creatures and other beings. Um, it's not meant to be ter- in my way of worshiping. It's not meant to be terribly solemn. Uh, and it's also not really particularly all that formal, which is one reason, frankly, why I'm a witch as opposed to a magician or a wizard or a sorcerer. There are people who use those terms very, very deliberately, and they are far more formal in their magical practice. They have very specific rules that they follow and view the world through. 
my rules are fewer and farther between. Yeah, I don't like rules. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> rules are can be useful, but breaking them is um, often quite an interesting experience and can be very, very useful sometimes. <laughs> well, I'm loving this conversation. I would love to know more about the books that came before this. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, it's kind of funny because this is a beginner book, um, but actually the previous books I wrote were not particularly beginner at all. Um, uh, the one most previous to this one is Magical Connections, which is about creating um, healthy spiritual groups. So it's a lot about the group dynamics of magical groups and why it is that so many magical groups fail after three years. There's a very specific cyclical pattern that, that happens in my theory that um, you can see and you can watch and you can alter so that your group actually makes it through three years. And gets longer and has different issues, but <laughs> you can at least get over that initial hump. Um, so Magical Connections, which has been out since 2009, it's, it's still easily available. And then in 2021, I re-released uh, a book that I'd written in 2002 called The Virtual Pagan. And The Virtual Pagan 2.0 is all about magic online. It is it was perfect for the pandemic because a lot of people who never thought you could do magic online or do ritual work online or teach magic online, uh, all were suddenly realizing that if they wanted to keep their practices going, they were going to have to learn how to do that because of the pandemic. And so this is something I've been working on for 20 plus years. I'm oddly an authority in this area. And, um, it's kind of fun but <laughs> it's out there and that's available um basically through amazon it's amazon publishing it but you can get a kindle version as well so not just print well i would recommend to everybody to pick up at least a copy of this new book because you've got a glossary at the end that is fascinating it is full of so many clear definitions as to what everything means and how to use it and i just think that's one of the best parts about the book besides all the practical information in between so thank you yeah well thank you for for doing the work that you do and thank you for being on the boundless authenticity podcast please tell everybody where we can find you uh, you can always find me online on the hopefully easy to remember lisa mcsherry.com website and all of my appearances and podcasts and soon to be coming up projects are going to be available there. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure.